Welcome back to the Good Success Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Keller, and we've got El Presidente Tom Wilson of Good Success with us today. I'm excited. You was you uh you missed out on the the interview with Mark Cunningham, I which know. is which is pretty good, but there you know they bummed. had some things going on, but it, it's all good. I was bummed. It's still it was it was a it was a great interview. Mark is a, Mark's a good guy. He's a cool good he's a cool dude. Um, but today we've got the one, the only Marco Santorelli on the horn right now. Marco, what's going on? We're excited to have Marco. you, man. Hey guys, it, I'm excited to be here. Uh, you know, with two rock stars like you, uh, this is going to be a great show. Hey, he was talking to you. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> I don't know who the other one was, but <laughs> so so Marco is CEO of Norada, and uh, we'll have Tom's got a little bit more experience with them. Yeah, I don't have the lights on, but I'll do some posts. It's, it's all good. We're, We'll work with it. We'll work with it. I was dealing with the audio, so we were having some audio see, problems. I can't like myself on the screen. It's all good. We're, we're looking here. We're looking at this camera, okay. so it's okay. That's but, true. That, that camera's good. So so anyway, so Marco is the CEO of Norada um, Real Estate Group, and well, I'll probably have Tom talk about that a little bit more. I have personally known uh, Marco for about two months now since the Atlanta event, but I know Marco, oh. or, uh, Marco and Tom have had a a um, little bit of a longer relationship. And then he has a podcast called the Passive Real Estate Investing Podcast, which is a huge podcast. And uh, we were just chatting about this. We know that Apple is doing some weird things with the algorithms right now for the rankings. But for the past four months, so prior to that, for the past four months, Marco's podcast has actually been in the top 10 for business podcasts altogether. And there's a lot of podcasts out there. So this one is excellent. If you guys have it for like the 5% of you that have not heard about this podcast, make sure you go check it out. That's the Passive Real Estate Investing Podcast. You guys, you love the content. Absolutely fantastic stuff. So um, we'll come back around here to Marco, allow him to fully introduce himself a little bit more. Um, but before we get into it, if you guys haven't already, make sure you have subscribed to the Good Success Podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, all the podcast platforms. Just go there, um, subscribe to us. Leave us a review if you're able to. We know Apple Podcasts may be the only platform that you can, but we would love to hear your guys' thoughts on um, if you like our podcast or not. And then if you have any input on anybody that we should interview, we would Totally be open, uh, totally be open to that. So make sure you go and review us. And then we have the active turnkey book. Tom, I'm running out of these. I don't have a lot left. We had a, bo a huge box and they are disappearing. Um, I think this one's signed by you. Yep, there you go. I have a copy. It's a good book. Marco's Marco. got one. So yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so you liked it? It's a good book. It is a good book. Yeah, yeah. I have it. I actually have it on my nightstand. There you Boy, go. I feel so the, special. Do you feel special? Tom, I do. Tom, Marco. I take you. I take you to bed with me, Tom. <laughs> Marco has you. You hear it. You heard it here, folks. He's got your book right next to him when he sleeps. That man, that's a staple right there. But anyway, you guys can pick up your copy. I think that should be one of your mini contents. Right it's there. going to be. I, yeah, I, take, I, totally. I take your book to yeah, bed totally. with me. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So, so the original one was that the book's worth uh, the same amount as a spaceship. Yes, so that's you what you keep saying. Trade Josh. it for a spaceship, yes, you but now <laughs> Marco had he upped that yes, game. So. <laughs> but anyway, you can pick up your copy just like Marco did. Active Turnkey book, the best way to buy rentals, written by Tom Olson himself. We're giving this away for free. All you gotta do is go to atkbook.com and pick up your free copy there. All we do is ask you to uh, pay for shipping costs, and Tom's paying for the book himself. Like I said, we're running out of these, and actually included in the package now is we recorded the audio book for uh, chapter one of this. So Tom himself read that, that was pretty cool. So you guys are gonna get chapter one in audiobook form as well. So again, that's atkbook.com is where you can pick this up for free, just cover shipping and handling, and we'll take care of the rest. And then the Good Success Mastermind. So this podcast is going out um, on the Tuesday, so I believe this is the sixth, and the Mastermind's this week. That's it's in Miami. We're about to. We're gonna wrap up here and get ready to head out to Miami pretty soon here. But we're super excited about this. We got 11 new faces right now that are gonna be there. It's gonna be an awesome, awesome event. Very excited about that. Do you wanna elaborate anymore? Talk about it. I mean, it's it's just gonna happen. It's come up so fast. It's a long week. We have a lot it's of a <laughs> people that are gonna be there in a mastermind settings. You've never been in a traditional mastermind where everybody. Um, gets their own time to present and everybody gets time to be able to give feedback on their number one challenge and the number one thing in their business that if they could solve, it would make a huge difference in their in their life and their business. 
Um, I highly recommend if you don't join the Good Success Mastermind or see us, go join some mastermind that you think that you can connect with. But I'm super excited. This week is going to be um, kind of a catapult, I think. And we've already actually have, I think we have 11 new people at this event. And we actually already have eight people that actually have signed nine up. Because I forgot about one other person, uh, Craig Wilcox. That okay, that's me, right. So, so we have nine that have already committed to coming in February. February and we haven't even done any, any advertising yep. for that. So... Um, February is going to be for, for a whole week, and we're excited about that because we're going to kind of split the groups up and have a have a keynote day and a fun day on Wednesday in, in the middle, and it's going to be fun at Quest. With, so that'll be that'll be kind of fun as well to be able to network with the people at Quest. Yeah, Quincy and Nathan are going to be hosting us. That's pretty cool. Yes, and they're not Quest IRA anymore. They're Quest, Quest Trust, Trust Company. Trust yes. Company. We'll get them on the podcast pretty soon to explain why they uh, they changed their name and kind of elaborate on that. But anyway, um, to learn more about the Good Success Mastermind, signups for the Miami event are pretty much closed out right now unless you live near the Miami area um, and you're listening to this the day before, then you know give us a call. But um, for February, you guys can go sign up for that. All you got to do is visit goodsuccess.com slash mastermind. Fill out the application there, then you'll jump on the phone with either myself or Tom, and we'll uh, kind of vet you through the phone. We do have our core values, which we vet by uh, also the volume of deals that you're doing and, and your your business. But um, our core values are the main thing, community growth, stewardship, and charity. Um, so goodsuccess.com slash mastermind. Learn more about it. Our next event is in Dallas at the Quest Trust Company's office in Dallas, Texas. Um, February right now right we actually have it six seven and eight but it's gonna be going back to four through eight so a full week because we're looking at the four, we're five, looking at the agenda seven. yesterday for the Miami one and it's like going all the way through day three so that's that's a long three days but we're excited about it so one more time good success.com slash masterminds where you can do that and then early bird pricing for the community go-giver event is on sale right now communitygogiver.com is where you can save a couple hundred bucks and pick that up and uh, Tom, I actually did with Mark uh, or uh, with Mark uh, Cunningham uh, when we when I had him on. I did announce the headline speakers that you had because you have those yes. nailed down. Yes. So right now it is yourself. It's Jim Ingersoll, Jeffrey Taylor, um, Aaron Chapman. Mm -hmm. That's a new face, so that's awesome. And then Jeff Johnson. Jeff Jeff Johnson. You uh, Sonia Booker. Sonia Booker. Um, somebody from Quest will be here. Yes, that's yeah. So I was thinking Quincy, but I think someone else might might be coming, may, maybe Nathan or somebody, but for sure. Well, that's cool. So you guys can save a couple hundred bucks right now. Early bird pricing is going on. Communitygogiver.com is where you can pick that up, and we will ha have a few more details once we get a little bit closer to the event, and that's June 26, 27, and 28. One more time, communitygogiver.com is where you can get those uh, early bird pricing. So I also have a secret announcement. You have a secret announcement? Yeah. Do I know about this? You don't know, Josh. Okay. We're actually, so we're actually going to also do, and this is probably a good time to do this with Marco being on here, but we actually do have, the, we're going to back up to the Community Go-Giver event. We're going to do a bus tour the whole day oh, before right. with Olson Group and Olson Property Services to actually let people come in if they want to specifically just mm -hmm. come for that. We're going to kind of, we're not really going to do the two events together, but if, if people want to come for both, that, sure. that, that'd be a good thing. So people that want to come to the community go-giver event, if you're a turnkey buyer or a lender, you want to come see us, we're going to do a bus tour on that Tuesday before the community go-giver in June. Sounds good. You guys heard it here. That was the secret. And I actually did know about it oh, okay. because Jared told me yesterday. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I did know about it, but it's all good. So communitygogiver.com one more time. Um, and we'll have all those links below if you guys are watching on Facebook premiere. Um, and if you're not, on the, if you're on the podcast, then we're going to be having show notes coming out pretty soon. So I'm excited about that. So be on the lookout for that. Without further ado, we're going to stop yammering and hand this over to Marco Santorelli. So I'm excited to have you on, Marco. I got a really good set list of questions here to ask you. We're going to pick your brain. And uh, but before we do that, if you could do us a favor, and for like the five percent of people that are listening right now that don't know who you are, give us an introduction. Um, maybe uh, talk about your podcast. Obviously, talk about Norada, and then yourself. Sure. Well, I am. I consider myself a real estate investor, an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, a podcaster, an author. Uh, uh, hopefully, an all-around good guy. Just ask my wife. <laughs> but. Um, no, I, you know, I, look, I, I love investing. I love real estate. I love helping people. You know, I do a lot. Of, I spend a lot of time educating people on real estate investing and how to do it, especially from investing out of their area or out of state. Um, but, you know, I, I bought my first property when I was 18 years old. That's when the writing was on the wall and I just kept running with it. And uh, I really grew my portfolio in early 2004, late 2003, early 2004. 
uh, I was investing up in your neck of the woods, um, buying a lot of property up in the north uh, east. And so, um, you know, I just I just kept continuing doing what I'm doing today. But today, you know, I have a much bigger, broader goal, and that's really to help a million put a million people on the path to financial freedom. And you know, property is is not the reason you invest in real estate. It's it's the product. Uh, the reason is because you want financial freedom, you want time freedom, you want to spend time with your family and then give back to the community, give back to people and charity and help other people. Uh, some people call that paying it forward. Um, you know, I've been trying to pay it forward for many years and I, you know, the more you put out there, the more you give and the good vibes you you put into the universe, the more it comes back to you. And, and I've just found that to be true time and time and time again. So that's a little bit about me. You know, it's just for me, it's all about, hey, let's just make the world a better place. Let's invest. Let's help other people. Let's do what you love and what you have a passion for. So, so go ahead and elaborate a little bit more on your podcast. So what can people expect if, they, if, they, if they're not currently listening to the podcast? If somebody went there, what could they expect when, uh, when getting there? Yeah. So, you know, Tom and I, I think, are, are pretty much in sync and on the same page when it comes to you know, turnkey investments and turnkey real estate investing. And, you know, we classify them into two broad buckets. You know, you've got your active approach uh, or, or what you might call active real estate investing. Then you've got a more passive approach where it's, it's more or less a done for you model, but I like to call it done with you. Um, but essentially, you know, the bulk of the work is done and it's, you go shopping, you know, with the help of the right team, people that you can trust and and, and have as advisors to help you pick the right markets that make sense for you and your goals and then pick the right neighborhoods and the right properties. That's a more passive approach. Um, with active real estate investing, it, you know, it kind of borders on a lot of what you guys do as well as the passive approach. But what I like to focus on on the show to answer your question, Josh, and that is really just, let's talk about virtually anything and everything related to real estate investing with a bit of a slant or a skew or a bias towards the passive model because I don't want people to fall in love with those TV shows on A&E or wherever it may be that are just swinging hammers and they don't see all the heavy lifting and the risks that go on behind the scenes where you're actually losing money or you have cost overruns or you're dealing with idiotic you know, contractors and on and on the list goes. So look, that's fine for some people. I've done three and a half years of that myself. Um, you need thick skin and you really need to know what the heck you're doing. Uh, but I favor the more passive approach to real estate investing where you can spend your time with your friends and your family and focus on your career and focus on the people you love and continue to build real estate and achieve the same financial goals as everyone else without having all the brain damage of taking that active approach. So that's some of what we talk about on the show. And, um, you know, today, actually, you mentioned Aaron Chapman, you know, Aaron, Aaron was on the show today, along with one of our other preferred lenders. And so we're doing kind of a hybrid model of, of having insight from different people in the mortgage industry. So it's asset protection one week, it's lending the next week, it's mindset. I had Brendan Burchard on three weeks ago, you know, I number one, Love Brendan. Yeah, he's, you know, the guy's a rock star, um, you know, just really, really high level, high profile type of guy. And, you know, it was, it was so much content there. We had to break the show into two parts, you know, mm. two episodes. So that's the show. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I did hear that podcast. That was a really, really good podcast with Brendan Burchard. Love, love cool. Brendan Burchard. Thank um, you. Okay, so then can you talk can, about Narada? Or, can, yeah, can, can we just back up a little bit because we're kind of getting in deep here and I kind of want to, I want to, I want you to clarify something. So when you say passive, w w what does that include for you? Like on your show or, or, or what, what you like to talk about, what are those different, what's the buffet for you for, for, passive investments? Yeah, Tom, that's a good question. So in general terms, that would be investing in real estate that is essentially uh, new or like new. So you are not doing any repairs, maintenance or rehab. Uh, so you essentially close escrow and walk into cash flow. And there's not much that you need to do other than go through the transaction, do the financing, sign the paperwork with the property manager. And now you're, you're in the deal and you just put one more property in your portfolio and you move on to the next. That's one form. The other form is if you are a limited partner or a partner of some kind in a partnership, what many people refer to as real estate syndication, and you are not the general partner, you're not taking the active role in that, that model, that's also a way to invest in, in real estate passively because you are an equity owner and you are getting all the benefits of real estate. And so in that model, you are just playing in a bigger game on a bigger deal. 
Those are the two passive models. When you start getting involved in managing contractors or doing you know, the labor yourself, that to me starts to get into the active side of things. So your definition might be different, but that's conceptually how we would classify passive investments. But, okay, so for you, it's basically single family or it's, it's maybe larger packages or possibly apartments with syndication or do you just really kind of focus on the single family? Well, as a company, we focus on single family duplex, triplex, and fourplex. That, that's the product that we offer as a company to investors, to clients. Um, but in terms of subject matter, passive could be any scale. It could be a 500 unit apartment building and you just happen to be one of 50 or 100 partners in that deal. Right. You get a K-1 statement every year. You still have the same depreciation write-offs, the same equity growth, the same cash flows. Um, you're not managing the deal, you're just a partner in the deal. That's passive as well. So the scale doesn't matter. What we sell as a product is typically one to four unit. We have the occasional syndication, but um, but that's kind of where I draw the line. Beyond that, you're dealing with a different, different type of real estate investment like notes, which is still passive. And that certainly would qualify as a passive real estate investment, but you don't have any equity ownership. You have no ownership, you have no equity growth. It's just, look, you got a rate of interest, you get cash flow every month. For a fixed period of time, the note matures and you're done. So, so, so you don't really focus on maybe lending or note investing. You're really more focused on just the equity side. Um, as a product, typically, yes. Now, that doesn't mean we haven't had note investment options. We've had notes that have paid as much as 15% simple interest per year. Uh, we did that for almost four years. I stopped doing that because we ended up... <laughs> going off in a different direction um, in the cannabis space. So those notes are still available, but they're no longer tied to real estate directly. They're not backed by the real estate. They're backed by a cannabis grow operation, legalized, of course, you know, licensed the, the whole ball of wax there. Uh, but real estate underlies it. So there's land, there's buildings, and then there's the real estate, op uh, the cannabis operation inside it. So we've, we're, do we're doing notes based on that type of investment. Um, Passive, yes. Real estate based, not necessarily. Right. But, um, but I would consider a note on a piece of real estate that has a rate of return as a passive investment as well. That's real estate related. Sure. So when when you're going out and looking for investments, or you're you're talking to your um, your, your the the people that want to come to you to help you find passive investments, what are your what are your kind of key qualifiers? to help them or for, for, for yourself, for instance, on a, on a deal, the person you're working with, areas. You, you're talking about uh, tactically in terms of what they have for cash and credit, or are you talking about more on a, a, a personal or philosophical basis? F f philosophical, so like not for the person, but like what kind of assets are you trying to advise people or, or whatever you wanna call it, or consult people into buying or what What are you buying, I guess? Okay, so I can answer both those questions in one shot. Um, and I hope, I hope I'm answering your question the right way here, but generally speaking, we wanna put people in markets that make sense from day one. So these are markets that have, you know, growth, job growth, stability, a healthy housing market, ideally, you know, positive net migration. Uh, those there are exceptions to the rule by the way but those are generally what we look the things we look for at a macro level then as you start to drill down what i call a funnel you start to look at submarkets, neighborhoods and then then the property we never start someone with a property first because you have to step back and look at the forest not the, just the trees and many investors make the mistake of getting you know seduced or married to a property and not realizing that's in the middle of a war zone in a market that's been depressed for you know three decades so um so you work, start with the market, work your way down to the neighborhood and the property, then definitely have the right team around you. Property management is critically important. Um, you know, having the right people that have worked on that property or produced the property for you, that's another critical component. Um, and uh, of course, being in the right demographic, having the right type of tenant class, because the tenant is not just a tenant, the tenant is a customer. The person you are serving as a landlord is is your customer and that is your tenant so you have to identify do i want do i want to be dealing with uh low income uh middle class lower middle class upper middle class you, you got to start to ask these questions of yourself if you don't we will because that's what we do in our, in our strategy sessions we got to find out where our clients are comfortable because some people live in an a-class neighborhood 
they relate, they grew up in, you know, great quality neighborhoods, but they don't relate to low, you know, low income uh, uh, customers, you know, tenants. And so there's this disconnect and it makes them feel uneasy and uncomfortable on a day to day basis. They don't sleep well at night because they're constantly worried about people skipping out, skipping rent, you know, leaving damage on the turn when they, you know, the tenant moves out, you know, they just don't relate. And so we've got to make sure that you are investing in what is comfortable. So I'm, I'm kind of answering your question in a very, very broad way, but no, it's uh, perfect. It's perfect. I'm glad you brought that up because, um, I think, I, you know, I was just at a mastermind this last weekend and I, you, you get all these questions from people and I'm like, okay, well, we have to have another conversation before I can answer that question from you. You know, like, <laughs> you know, I, I can't just tell you to buy any of the houses that I own until we talk about like questions sure. like you just answered, you know, like you, you just said. So what, what, what are you comfortable with? Um, and, and, and not only that, back it up even farther to what are your personal financial goals? Because at some point, like they, maybe they shouldn't even do some of this stuff. So um, I, I, I think that, that that's a perfect answer. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and his answer, by the way, is a perfect segue into the, the one of the questions that I have here. So um, when I the first time I did meet you, you presented at the Think Realty Leadership Circle and you talked a little bit about hot markets. Um, you had some really interesting thoughts. So my question to you is, for turnkeys specifically, what are the hottest real estate markets um, in the country and why? There's really no answer to that question because you got to ask yourself, what do you mean by a hot market? Because most people will define a hot market as a market that is appreciating um, above its long-term historical average. In other words, that property prices are accelerating and you're gaining equity through appreciation on an ongoing basis. And that's not necessarily the best way to invest because you could do that in Southern California or, or in San Francisco, but you're not going to cash flow. You're not going to have a rate of return. They're very expensive properties. It's unaffordable. You have a lot of downside risk because land values are incredibly high. So that's a hot market by many people's definition, but that doesn't make it a good market to invest in. So when you talk about a hot market, you have to say, well, hot in terms of what? In terms of cash flow, in terms of its historic appreciation, in terms of its forecasted appreciation. So right now, a place like, let's say, Jacksonville, Florida, I would call a hot market. We are putting clients in Jacksonville, Florida right now uh, for those that are looking for a good balance, a hybrid between cash flow, which would be also tied to your cash on cash return, <laughs> and also appreciation potential. We've seen good, strong, historic uh, price growth here in the last one to three years. And according to the research we've done and everything that we can see, all indicators point that that market will continue to grow uh, over the next one to three years uh, fairly well. It'll be a strong market in terms of price growth. You've got strong demand, a healthy housing market. A lot of people are moving into that area. You've got the port expansion going on. There's a lot of things happening to make that market a good pick. So you could call that a hot market based on your definition of what a hot market is. Memphis is not an exciting market, it's a very boring market. Um, it's a sleeper, but it, it's got a strong rental market and it's, a, it, it, it's just a good base to have a long-term buy and hold uh, cash flow um, base. Your market is a great market too in Northwest Indiana. I mean, I, I don't, I, maybe Gary's changing, but you know, I think the area you're in is maybe transitioning from some, to some degree from what I call just a cash flow stable linear market to more of a growth market. Um, so it would make it a hybrid market. Uh, so if that's hot for you, great. That's where you should be investing right now. So that's not a specific answer to your question because hot is, is, is in, you know, in the eye of the beholder, how you define hot. Sure thing. Uh, yeah. And that, that's kind of, you, you answered the question the way I wanted it to, because it's, there's no straightforward definition. That's kind of what you mentioned. Um, right. Yes, yeah, so you got to be careful with national real estate now because um, you, you we don't really have a national market anymore. Like you don't have this natural all every every county going up, every county going down. You have all these sub pockets and all these sub areas. I mean, really, you'll have uh, zip codes next to zip codes where one's going up in value and the other one's going down in value. So you right. have to be very careful to kind of understand all those sub markets now. It's, it's just a completely different ball game than it was 20, 30 years ago. So then what are some things that you could tell people to better understand a market? Like what, what do you need to look for when you're trying to um, passively invest in real estate in a good market? 
what are you looking for in a market to to choose it as a market? Is that your question? Yes. Um, it, well, the two key things I look at is what I mentioned before. I, I, I want to. I don't want to go into a place that is depressed. So I want to make sure that you have a stable job market. Ideally, you have job growth. Um, you have a broad industry, meaning that it's not a market that is heavily contingent on one particular industry, like oil and gas, for example, which we saw in North Dakota when you know oil was over $100 a barrel, and then when oil came down below 50. You know, it was a ghost town because they capped all the wells, they laid everybody off, everybody left, and now you had all this excess housing that was sitting there vacant. So you, you want to avoid a situation where you have a narrow housing, in uh, a not narrow industry in a market. You want a broad market. You want tourism, manufacturing, um, finance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so jobs are critical. Um, Usually, when you have uh, strong job growth and broad industry, it brings in uh, migration. People move to the area. Texas is a great example of this, where they've been for over a decade, uh, you know, recipients of people moving out of many other states, particularly California, because they can get uh, less expensive housing, a lower cost of living, great jobs, and plentiful jobs. And so you've seen you know all these texas markets just grow like crazy and and because of that you know they've been strong uh strong markets in terms of appreciation um inventory is low even though they have a lot of land to build on uh, but those are the two key things i look at so jobs and migration and, a, and i guess if you add a third it would be just you know a diverse uh, a, a diverse uh, economic base so a lot of a lot of industry that's the starting point. Remember, we're talking, you know, 40,000 foot level here, mm -hmm. you know, broad terms. Now you start to look at sub markets and then you start to break that down even further. And if you have the right team on the ground, they can direct you in the right areas, you know, to, to, to focus on where the numbers make sense, where there is growth, where there's a strong t tenant pool um, and, you know, where the numbers make sense and it's affordable and you can, I mean, you guys are experts in your area. So you, you could definitely tell people what areas to avoid, what areas to be in, where there's growth, where there's strong tenant demand. Um, that's the importance of having the right team, but knowing the market first is the starting point. Perfect. Okay. So then let's, let's talk about turnkey providers, uh, specifically. So, uh, we're, we're on the other side. So we're not talking about like the, the people that are passively investing. We're talking about the actual turnkey providers. Um, what are some things that you think that, so, so you obviously deal with turnkey providers very much. So yep. what are some things that you notice from providers that maybe they're missing? Maybe it's things that they should be doing. Maybe it's things they shouldn't be doing. Um, just gaps with the turnkey providers uh, in general. What are, what are a couple of things that you're noticing that people can improve on? The first thing that comes to mind has nothing to do with property and that's communication. I can't tell you how many people we've worked with on and off over the years that their communication just simply sucked. Um, they were slow or uh, slow in getting back to us and therefore slow in getting back to the client because we can't help the client the investor build their portfolio if we're trying to put them in a per particular market where we are operating in with a particular provider and we can't get the inventory the right inventory the answers to the questions on that inventory and so communication is a big one I, I it's one of my pet peeves you know whether it's phone or email you, you've got to be responsive um, you know within hours or within the next day to get back to the people that you're trying to, to serve in the first place. So communication is a big one. Um, everything I else think is almost- I think that's actually even more important if you're out of state. So mm -hmm. like if you're an out of state investor, like yeah. as, soon, as soon as you, as soon as you feel like somebody's not communicating you, it's like a tenant, you know, sure. like as soon as a tenant doesn't take your phone call or as soon as a tenant doesn't respond or coming back to you, you're like, okay, this is guys, here we go. Like, so I think it's the same, it's, I, I think it's, I think it's, that, that's very important. Sure. Yeah, and if you don't hear from someone in a timely manner, especially when it comes to things related to finance, your your mind doesn't go and start thinking positive things like, oh, things are working out well or things are, are you know, rosy. You start to think negative thoughts like, right. uh, you know, is there something wrong? What's happening? Did my tenant move out? You know, are we missing a payments? Is Are there, you know, did someone run off with my cash? You, you know, you start thinking negative things. So communication is definitely very important. Absolutely. Um, you know, as far as other things related to providers, um, is uh, I mean, everything seems like, seems to be like a distant second. But uh, having consistency, consistency in the quality of the product they produce, 
uh, if they're vertically integrated and they actually do the management piece as well as you know produce the product um, just having the smooth transition between those two businesses and then also having uh, consistency and consistency in communication payments uh, reporting uh, those things are all important you know and, and when those things get um, loosey-goosey they start to break down that's when we start to hear from our clients uh, with questions or even complaints about the particular providers that we put them in touch with and that we've worked with and, and you know sold them properties so can't think of a third one those are probably the two biggest things so consistency and reporting um, what, what sh- yes yeah, so what should be the that that is part of communication absolutely so but so what what is expected or what what do you think should be the expectation as far as that's concerned in terms of everything or communication the, the financial reporting just just spe- um, specifically because fi- I'm pretty big on that myself honestly like this is something where if I don't get my financial reports when I'm supposed to get them then I'm like I'm having an email I, I send an email or text right away <laughs> so I understand that on, on both thing on both sides of that so so what do you think is a good SLA, you know, service level agreement from the owner to the, um, because on the flip side, like I can tell you the exact same thing from a property management standpoint, we will send an email to an owner and we won't get an answer for two months. And then they'll wonder why we didn't do something. I'm like, well, it says in our contract, we can't do this unless we get, you know, an approval back from you. We sent you six emails and we've called you four times and we don't, we don't hear that back mm-hmm. as well. So it, it, it kind of goes both ways on the communication. But I do think there should be a, a, a expectation on the financial reporting of, of what they should get every month or every year and, you know, what kind of timely manner should it be done in. Yeah, it's definitely a two-way street. Um, th- everybody should have certain um, responsibilities to the other party. So, um, uh, you know, in terms of reporting, I mean, a lot of this stuff is now automated. You know, there are online tools and, you know, there's, uh, you know, property wear and all kinds of online tools where th- these things are automatic. You know, you, you put in the information and it spits out an email or a notification and you get that. So it, you almost don't need to do anything. You, you can automate this whole thing now. But um, bottom line is just com- regular communication, especially if it's outside the norm, you know, outside the regular deposits and, and um, uh, you know, rental income coming in, deposits going into your bank account, that, that stuff is all automated. But if it, there's something outside of that, just notifying the landlord, uh, the owner of the property right away, what the situation is. A lot of times that to me comes in in the form of an email. It's like, okay, work order has been open. We don't know what the problem is. We're assessing it, you know, co- tenant complaint about such and such. Great. I know what's going on. I have a heads up. I don't. I don't need to know exactly what it is today. But that communication, regardless of how it comes in, is is makes it is helpful. It makes me feel good. It keeps me dialed in as kind of my, the CEO of my company and you know my property managers, my frontline management team, and they're managing my assets. So that part of it's important. The property management is critically important. Um, but prior to buying the property, communication, like I said before, just going back and forth, being able to answer questions, produce documents, or get the information needed to do diligence on particular properties because I'm looking at them or considering them as an addition to my portfolio is also important. There's nowhere along that transaction from today and forever that communication should ever break down. If, there's, if it does, there's a, there's a situation, there's a problem, and it needs to be questioned. Very interesting. We had, yeah, I keep referring to our previous podcast with Mark Cunningham, and that was a thing that he, because, you know, he's a property manager, and he's like, communication is the number one thing that you have to do as a property manager. So, yeah, that's obviously mm-hmm. a very big staple in a, in a business and should be. Um, so so then let's go back to the passive side of the, the real estate investing and staying on the track of turnkeys. So for, and this, this might be a very broad question, but when it comes down to, um, uh, you, you talked about for equity wise, uh, r- investing in real estate. Do you think that turnkeys are the best option for that, for, for a passive real estate investor? Best option in terms of what? For, for yeah. investing in real estate. So actual real estate. So, um, you, you know, you talked about notes. So for instance, so is, is turnkeys the best way to do that? Um, in my opinion, it is because look, what are your options? If, if, if you want to look at the, the entire landscape of what's out there, the best thing you could possibly invest in are, are businesses, a successful business, an existing business, because there's an established 
uh, uh, customer base and cash flow and you can put a value on a business. But that's not possible for most people because how often do you come across a business for sale or a business that's existing that you can buy into? Uh, you can start your own, but that's high risk. It's got a high failure rate over the course of 12, 24, and 60 months. So what's the next best option? Well, Marco, it's, you could invest in the stock market, isn't that businesses? That's one of my questions here too. <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're investing in a business, yes. However, you have no control, no say, uh, probably no ability to vote. Uh, you're you're not participating in the cash flow unless there's a dividend, uh, which is pretty rare these days. And even if you do get a dividend, it's so small that it's 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 negligible, and you could do far better in so many other things. You might as well, you could probably just throw your money at a bunch of crypto currency and and do better than that. Um, <laughs> so I'm not suggesting that someone go out and do that, but. <laughs> Um, but you know, the stock market is just what I call push button investing. You know, it's just easy to set up a, an account, you know, put some cash in it, fund it, you know, uh, buy some equities on the stock market and that's it. You're done with it, but you have no control and no one has any idea how well that's going to perform, uh, any better than you do. You could literally throw a dart on a wall, uh, you know, on a, on a newspaper and pick a, pick some stocks and, you know, <laughs> they do what they do. It's extremely volatile and a lot of people don't like that. They don't sleep well at night. But all I'm saying is, look, you go across the spectrum of all the different asset classes and you look at what are all the benefits? How many dimensions or facets do they offer? Real estate's the best. You've got income, you've got depreciation, you've got equity growth from the amortization of the loan, which by the way, your tenant is paying off. You have appreciation over time because real estate is nothing more than commodities and it's gonna keep, keep up with the rate of inflation. It has to because it's built with sticks, bricks, concrete, and, and copper. Um, and the land is not going to go anywhere. The land will always be worth something. It'll never go to zero. Um, and lastly, you could leverage it. You could leverage it better than any other asset class, you know, five to one. You know, the best you could do with anything else is you know, the stock market, which is, you know, two to one. You have 50% margin account. And the risk with that is if your stocks are volatile and they drop, guess what? Your broker is going to call you with a margin call. You're going to have to put up cash because they're not putting it up for you. So you can't, again, my opinion, but you can't beat real estate, investment real estate, you know, cash flow real estate. Yeah, I, I was at a mastermind this last weekend and somebody showed how even if like they had a year in because so he, he showed an example where a guy had five properties and he even had a year where one of the properties was negative cash flow because they had a, they, they had a major repair. Hmm. And, but if you took everything that you just mentioned, if you took at the appreciation of the exact same year in those exact same towns, if you took the, the, uh, all the other benefits of the appreciation of the uh, equity pay down from the tenant, if you, if, if you took all those things and calculated it, it was like a 58% return for that year. And even though like just if you look at the, just the cash flow part of it, it, it it was it was actually still positive. It was like twelve percent cash on cash return for that year for the for the cash flow, but it wasn't like what most people are looking for um, today because they had some repairs on the on the property. So I, I think that that's a very key thing to, uh, to 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 talk about. For me personally, I believe in 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 a little bit of of a diversification. I am not big on the stock market, so I do not own any stock. I don't believe in that's just not. I feel like some in my opinion. I think somebody else has already made all the money. Um, you, you're you're buying way too much of at a multiple. Where I would much, if I'm going to go buy a business, I'm just going to go talk to f as many friends as I can and go talk to individual business owners that I can buy into an actual, you know, local business. That's just me personally. So my financial freedom plan is in three different areas. Buy is is business, where I've either helped consult or and and or I've helped invest into, um, or my my time or treasure or you know money into, and I own a piece of it. I don't have anything to do with it. Um, I love real estate and um, as you know, single family rentals is, is what most of my stuff is in. And then I love lending. So those are my three different, you know, buckets of, of, of passive income. So, um, but I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people don't, don't focus on the whole picture of real estate and, and, and really like, I think what it goes, what it leads to is it's not just the deal itself and it's not even just the numbers. It's the, always the deal after the deal that makes all the difference. It's always everything else that's happening um, around it. So you might, like a, a lot of people, a lot of my lenders, for instance, people that loan me money, they they would prefer to loan because they're sometimes they're getting a higher rate of return when they're just doing lending, but all they're looking at is just that 
one silo. They're not looking at all the five wealth drivers that, that come into real estate. And for really the last, you know, it's, I mean, for the last five or six years, we've had such low interest rates that it's almost like shorting the dollar to have to, you know, to get into real estate. Now, I, I believe that these low interest rates are probably not going to stick around forever. We're probably going to get back into a natural 6% type, um, you know, in, in interest rate. So in my opinion, I think in the next year or so, if you're going to get in, this is going to be a really good time to get in because we may not see interest rates. I know they've bumped up a little bit, but I don't believe we're going to see interest rates stay even where they're at. We, we may not see interest rates where they're at now for the next, I don't know, five or 10 years. What do, what's your opinion on that, Marco? Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to see another rate increase here before the end of the year. And that may or may not affect uh, mortgage rates, but we're, we're definitely expecting the feds to, to do another uh, you know, small bump in the rates. I do foresee mortgage rates going up a little bit into 2019, uh, but I have a really hard time seeing interest rates going up more than, let's say, a half to a full point um, by the end of next year. So, um, you know, it's we still have historically low rates, and if you just run the numbers, it's a moot point. We we still can buy great investment rental properties around the country that cash flow that produce a good rate of return. Um, we can still arbitrage and, uh, you know, take that spread when we leverage, you know, cheap money into investment property. So you're right. It's, it's a good time to buy. It has been a good time to buy for many years and it will continue to be a good time to buy. What's going to change is not, not the strategy and not, and, and not the asset class. What's going to change is the location that you invest in and, and maybe, you know, maybe the type of neighborhood that you're investing in, but the market is going to change for sure where you're investing in. And then you just have to adjust, you know, you know the uh, the, the neighbors that you're focused on. Uh, but yeah, lending is cheap, um, you know. And and the fact that lenders are still lending at 80% loan to value, uh, you're kind of crazy not to take advantage of that. It's, I mean, it, look, there was a time when we had 18% interest rates, and people were still investing in real estate. They found creative ways to do it, but you know, it still worked. Now it's compared to 18%, it's super cheap. So take advantage of it. So how can and somebody, you, no, go ahead. go ahead. Here's here's the other thing too. I mean, even, even if you consider 7%, you know, interest on a 30 year fixed to be expensive, look at it this way too. You're, you're locked in for 30 years. There's no change to that interest rate. But what, what does change is, is, is the purchasing power of your dollar over time. You know, you have inflation eating away at it every year. Your mortgage doesn't change. It's not adjusted to inflation. So it's your mortgage payment is not going up every year. So when you buy that property, you have a $500 mortgage payment today, it, it might look high initially, but guess what? In five years or even 10 years, you're gonna look back and that $500 mortgage payment is gonna be like a, you know, a, a latte at Starbucks. It's gonna be that, you know, so much lower in, in perspective. So you have inflation on your side. So just stock up on more more debt. And the other, the, the other side of that is if you make money Let's just say, let's just compare it to lending, which I think lending is a great thing too. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against lending. Sure. But if you just take the money you make at, on, a, on a lending deal, at the end of the year, what do you have to pay for that? You have to pay taxes on the, on the income, correct? Right. But at the same rental property, let's just say like we had 10.8% equity growth as far as like overall, and this, these were numbers that were pulled by a good friend of mine. Um, in, in Hammond, Indiana, last year, ten point eight percent is what is what we said was la last year average appreciation in Hammond, Indiana. Did anybody pay tax on that? Not if they did their taxes right. <laughs> well, no, you don't pay tax. I like your property goes up and down maybe in value, but number one, that the, the house doesn't know it goes up and down in value. The IRS doesn't necessarily know. You don't That's get right. taxed. You don't get taxed on that like you do on the stock market. And then when you when it goes down. You don't, you don't, you don't even know either because what happens is like for us, for instance, in 2008, the average, the average house was renting in Hammond, Indiana for $900. By 2012, the exact same house was renting for 1150 in Maryville, wow. in Maryville, Indiana in 2007, 2008, before the crash, they were renting for 1100 by 2010, they were renting for 1250. So like for us, we actually went up. The, the, the house actually, if you think about it for you as an as a owner, what actually was better for you. Even though like on the market, what the MLS would have said it's worth, it would have made it went down 10 or $15,000. It was actually better for you during that period of time. So you, and that's a tax advantage as well too. 
So, it, but so why did that happen? Why did that trend? Because less people way. could buy houses, which means there's higher demand. And rental real estate is all based on supply and demand. It's 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 the one That's rule right. that 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 goes for everything when it comes to to to, to buying rentals. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. You know, when you're a long term investor, it doesn't matter what the value of the property is, it can go up. And often over time, it does go up, but it can, it can come down and it can be worth less than what you actually bought it. I mean, if you buy right, that often, usually, in fact, most often doesn't happen. Correct. Especially if you're in, in you know, a stable and linear type market. But look, your your cost basis is fixed. Your mortgage payment is fixed. Your expenses might fluctuate up or down a little bit, but a little bit over time they go up. Uh, your rental, your rental income is is a slow, it changes real slowly, but often over time that's just going to continue to go up. So who cares what the value of the property is? It might be a hundred thousand today, ninety thousand next year, and then one hundred and ten thousand the year after that. Uh, but guess what? You have a ten. If you're in the right neighborhood, you're in the right location, right market. You have a tenant. You have a strong tenant base. You're going to have at least all the time. You have cash flow. That cash flow is paying uh, your expenses, your debt service, your equity will grow over time. And look, you just have to weather through the ups and downs. It's not, it's not a perfect, uh, it's not a perfect investment. But then again, no investment is perfect. But you do know that everything works in your favor over time with real estate, and you just have to stay in the game and have that staying power. That's why cash flow is so important. You know, it's the glue. I call it. I say this all the time. I, I mean. I tell people all the time, cash flow is the glue that holds your deal together. So, so just stick to it. It's funny. We, we and Marco have talked several times, but we never kind of gotten this deep on this. And it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, you guys are getting, I say like the exact deep. same, like it's not just cash flow is great. Don't get me wrong. If you could make two, $300 a month on a property, it's awesome. But at the end of the day, it really is the glue that holds the deal together. Some of the guys that I know that are the wealthiest, that's made the most money in real estate, are guys that have held properties for three, five, ten years and then sold, and and it's not about the cash flow. They, they don't even care about the cash flow. They it is just the glue that that actually holds the, the portfolio together. Then the question is, what did they do with the equity gain that that capital gain that they took out of the property? You know, did they reinvest it and did they do it the right way where they didn't pay taxes on it? You know, because some people just take the money and run and they you know go on a vacation, buy a car, and well, great. You know, so you made some money. You made some capital gains. You're going to pay 25% or 15% capital gains tax on it, but now you're blowing it away. You know, really, the smart thing to do is keep leveraging up, leveraging up, leveraging up. So you build a larger portfolio and build your cash flow along the way into a larger and larger and larger monthly amount. That's the smart way to do it. Can I do that when I buy stocks? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I, I'm done I, with you my, guys knocked out I'm all the rest with of my questions. Question, so. so if you have any more questions. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure you and Marco peeked at my notes before the show started. I did it. Knocked no. out knocked out all the rest of my questions. But no, man, nothing. Man, you guys are was, just, you guys are just was, that good. Yes. Well, well, thank you. You're good too, Josh. I appreciate it. Hey, I, I conducted this interview with barely having to ask my questions, so I'm totally cool with that. But um, man, this we got pretty deep on that, but um, we we're running out of time here. I've, I just looked at my watch and we're, oh, wow. we've, <laughs> we're, we're pretty far into this, but um, we got to wrap this up. So, I mean, we could totally go into this a lot deeper, but if you guys want to learn more about passive in, or uh, passive real estate investing, definitely go check out Marco's podcast. Um, the Marco's a good state. guy. Trust me. Marco's a fantastic trust me. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yes. you, Tom. You're a great guy too. <laughs> <laughs> he he has your book next to his or on yes, his nightstand. He, he brings so. my book to bed with him. <laughs> He's a good guy. It's it's, per, it's personal here. It's personal. <laughs> I can see that. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to learn more about passive real estate investing, uh, go check out Marco's podcast, the Passive Real Estate Investing Podcast. Um, we'll have that linked in the comments there, so you guys can go check that out. Um, but it's yeah, I mean, go go to Apple Podcasts, any platform, you just search that, and you'll it'll pull up. So um, we got to wrap this up. We got a couple more questions, Marco. These questions that I'm about to ask, we ask every single person that we get on the podcast here. Love to hear all these answers, um, but uh, that's that's how we're gonna wrap this up. So for us, you 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 know Tom very well, um, obviously. Uh, you know me for a little bit, but you know our whole message. So good success. Good success means a lot to us. We uh, we have our own definitions of it, and um, we really preach that. And it's really about the type of success. About uh, you know that that's what J uh, Joshua one eight. That's where we got it from the Bible. Um, but for you, you know us. So when you hear the term good success, what does that mean to you? What comes to your mind first? Um, it, it, it means 
whatever you put out in the world, you're helping other people first. And in return, as long as you're doing the right thing with the right motive, the right intention, it's going to help you as well. So it's not just about, um, it's about, you know, it's funny. I asked, I asked Tom this question once before, you know, why didn't you call it great success instead of good success? He said, well, good is better than great. And he explained why. And I couldn't remember all the nuances of your, of your answer, but it made sense when he, you know, explained it to me. But um, I think it's really just of having the right intentions and doing the right things for the right reasons. And if you do that, you know, you will naturally attract the right people into your life. You will naturally get rewarded and benefit. You know, it makes me think of Zig Ziglar. I'm pretty sure it was Zig Ziglar that said, you know, if you help enough, yep. if you help enough other people get what they want, you will have everything you ever want. And so that's kind of the framework that, you know, I, 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 I work off of. Perfect. Absolutely awesome. awesome. Um, and like then the you got, what's that? Like the go-giver. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so you got to leave our audience with one thing, whether it's a quote, piece of advice, maybe it's a book you've read. Um, one, one thing that you got to leave the audience with, what would that be? Take action. Most people fail because they don't take action. They, they, they take all the right steps. They learn what they need to learn. They spend money to learn it. They take the time out of their schedule to go to seminars and conferences. And they, they know what they need to do. They're pretty clear about it. They might have written goals. They've studied. They've got maybe some mentors. Uh, but, the, but at the end of the day, you could do everything 100% perfect, everything. And if you don't actually take action, you will still be in the same place you are today a year from now and two years and 10 years from now. If you guys haven't heard this enough, like <laughs> take, take action has been on our podcast for like the past 10 episodes as the leave the audience with one thing. You so might, that's huge. I, I think it's so, it's so important also, you may be the smartest person that's ever lived and you yeah. may have the best idea that's ever come up with for, and for anything. And if you don't take action on it, nobody knows and nobody cares. Well, as Tony Robbins says, you know, knowledge without execution is poverty. Yeah, right? I, mean, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, so. That's, that's basically it. <laughs> yeah, basically. In, in one quote. <laughs> All right, right, awesome. Well, Marco, we appreciate you being on, man. We're definitely going to have you back soon. Uh, we could talk about so much other stuff. I mean, business. We were talking about primarily passive real estate investing, but we could get into so many other things. Uh, Marco's just a, a superb guy. So we appreciate you being on. We look forward to having you back soon. But. Before we go, if somebody wanted to get in contact with you or get in contact with Norada, uh, obviously we've already talked about your podcast, but um, what's the best way to do that? Uh, could you mention your website or anything else that people should know about you? Yeah, yeah. Our, our, our two primary websites actually link to each other, so you can go from one to the other. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to forget Passive Real Estate Investing. That's the name of the podcast, but it's also the, the, the website, the home of the podcast. So PassiveRealEstateInvesting.com is really the best place to start. And that links over to our property website at noradarealestate.com. So either one works. Perfect. Awesome. And we'll have that linked in the description. So if you guys are on the Facebook premiere, you guys can uh, click on that. And then on the podcast, that's passiverealestateinvesting.com um, is where you can go check that out. So Marco, thank you so much for being on. Yes, sir. Marco. Thank we you for really being appreciate on. your time. Yeah, we'll have you back soon too. You guys are great. Thank you for, for your time and thanks for the invite. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. So that's going to do it for today's episode. And that was a good one. So you guys make sure if you haven't already, go subscribe to the Good Success Podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, all the podcast platforms. Just go there, search Good Success and subscribe. And again, if you can leave a review, make sure you do that. We would love to hear your guys' thoughts about these podcast episodes. Um, and then if you haven't already, I'll say it one more time. We've got only a few left. The Active Turnkey book. Marco's got this on his nightstand. <laughs> so it's obviously got to be good if Marco has it on his nightstand. But you guys go pick it up. Marco, Eight. you should send me a picture. Of yeah, you, we want. <laughs> with my we didn't put this in the show notes. <laughs> That's funny. Cool. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, sure thing. And you guys can pick up your book at atkbook.com. They're all going to be signed by Tom. So make sure you go take advantage of that great book. Um, a lot to, talking a lot about passive real estate investing. We've that's almost the entire show here. Um, Active Turnkey, the best way to buy rentals, written by Tom Olson himself. All you got to do is go to atkbook.com, pick it up. All you got to do is cover shipping costs. Tom's going to pay for the book himself, and you can take advantage of that. And then a good success mastermind. Obviously, the fourth quarter is this week. 
The mastermind is completely jam-packed full. It's insane. But you guys can go sign up for the February event, which is going to be happening in Dallas, Texas. You can check out goodsuccess.com slash mastermind to learn more about that. Fill out the application there, and then you'll talk, you'll get on the phone with either myself or Tom, and we'll vet you there and learn more about you and see if our group is a good fit for you. And then uh, the community go-giver event, early bird pricing is already going on. So make sure you take advantage of that. Save a couple hundred bucks, community go giver. Dot com is where you can learn more about that. More details to come soon as we get closer to the event, but the event is June 26, 27, 28 of next year. So make sure that you um, take advantage of saving a couple hundred bucks. That's gonna do it for today's episode. We appreciate you jumping on and remember to be a conduit and not a bucket. Work to have to give. We'll catch you guys on the next one.